Welcome everyone to week 14 of Open Life Science. Um, today uh, co-hosting is myself, I'm Emmy, and we have Malika here as well. Uh, and um, at the beginning of the call, we'd like to let you know that we have a code of conduct. Um, the link to the text is on page two, page two, page three, sorry, the page has gone down. <laughs> doesn't take long to read, but um, please uh, do so um, and um, like so learn sort of the expected behaviors that, that we expect in the call. But in general, we ask each, everyone to uh, be respectful and treat one another kindly. Um, and if you do witness or experience any of the behaviors that uh, isn't in line with the code of conduct, then you can report this to the team at life science, openlifescience.org that will reach Yo, Malvika and, or, and Berenice, or if you want to report it individually to one of them, then their email addresses are there on the agenda now on page four as well, right at the top. Um, as Malvika was mentioning, the uh, author transcript is working. There is a button that sort of sits at the top left corner of the Zoom screen. Um, so you can click that and open and you will get a written uh, transcript of what we're seeing real, somewhat real time. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, I think we have breakout rooms today. So um, have a bit of instructions about how to participate in those. So uh, please uh, rename yourself, edit your own Zoom name in Zoom. Um, the way you do that is you hover, your, you hover over your own image on Zoom. There is three dots to the top right corner. Click on that. There is a option to rename on the drop down menu. Um, please add a W in front of your name for written reflection based exercise, uh, which will happen in the main room, I believe, um, or an S for spoken discussion breakout rooms. So I'm uh, going to post the instructions in the chat in a minute as well. Um, but yeah, if you have, just pause for a minute for folks to do that and also to ask any questions that you may have at this point. Okay, uh, so please go ahead and edit your name when you have a second to do so. Okay, I'm um, going to start the main part of the call. Uh, today is about designing for inclusive communities. So uh, yeah, we've talked a, uh, quite a bit of, in the last couple of calls about open science and all of you are here because you are pursuing a project to open up knowledge, open up science, open up the work that you're doing. But I think a key to thinking about this um, and designing these projects is to think about sort of what you mean by open. So who are you opening for? And if your answer is something along the lines of everyone, then it's always good to think about are people, are there anyone that are being sort of excluded from um, the project or the work that you're doing? And so this is why it's important to sort of learn and to think about how to build a design process that will allow your project to be as inclusive as possible. Um, and also, so today we have, I think, a couple of reflection exercises as well as two talks, which will bring you through some of the frameworks and ways to start thinking about this as well. Uh, so starting with a, a silent note taking slash reflection exercise, we've asked you to um, as an assignment to do um, the implicit bias uh, test. I'm not sure if folks had the chance to go through that, but I hope you did. Um, so uh, we'd love you to share a bit of insights if you've done the test um, on sort of how you find it, what you learned from it, what surprised you maybe. And then if you, have, if you haven't, or if you also like to share, um, then we also have a couple of prompts. So What's a place that made you feel included for the, fir the first time you visited? This can be either online or in person. And then think a bit about what made that place so inclusive. 
um, if you can share sort of a bit of your experience in the notes with each other um, so that we can all learn, that would be great. So uh, let's do sort of five minutes of um, just typing and thinking. <laughs> this, we're down at sort of the middle, the lower half of page four on the Google Doc at the moment. Um, so let's let's do that. but also day-to-day -day experiences. Um, someone put down hairdresser, <laughs> um, which I got to put a big plus one next to this one. <laughs> if anyone would like to share out that as well, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, And then there are also folks who shared sort of your, your experiences doing the um, implicit bias tests, which is very interesting to read. Did, on, the, on the test, did, um, does anyone have, have any sort of things that you find surprising that you'd like to share verbally. This, I'm reading folks' comments about sort of how well shaped by the society around us and the tests really reflect this. Yeah, I, I did the test. <laughs> I have a moderate association as well in, in the worst, well, in the not the better sense. So, um, but yeah, I think that was sort of, I, I agree with a lot of the things that folks have written here. Um, yeah, unfortunately, but, but that's why we're here, right? It's, it's, it's about sort of trying to understand where we are at and trying to move towards uh, in the better, in, in, to improve ourselves and to, and to um, learn constantly. There's a lot of, there's a, 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 on the top of page five, there's a number of links um, about, I presume about implicit association as well. Would, would the person like to sort of talk a bit about um, what they've put down? Is that me? That this is Kirsty. Is are you talking about the links? These are links about the fact that the implicit bias test and implicit bias training doesn't show any um, sort of positive behavioral change in organisations. So those are those are just sort of the the last one is like quite a sort of technical one, a, a meta analysis of um, sort of construct validity. So even if you can get similar effects across different time points actually the test itself doesn't map particularly well to real world measures of implicit bias like actual measures of implicit bias and then the other articles are talking about the fact that implicit bias isn't a wildly useful thing for if you want to actually de deconstruct um biases so there's actually an awful lot of explicit bias that um that is actually easier and so probably more important to, to deal with folks on. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Yeah, it's it's important to to think about sort of, you know, 
it's it's good to to find ways to try and identify our biases, um, but also bear in mind sort of, I guess the the, the caveats and the, and and the extent to which these tests are useful and can be can be extrapolated beyond the test itself. So it's a continuous learning process, and um, yeah. As a group, I think we can, if we share what we know, then we can all learn a bit more about how to come, different ways to combat those biases and make ourselves even more aware of how we ultimately can change our behavior, if that's possible. <laughs> all right, loads to, loads to read folks, and that's great. I really love seeing this. Um, Thank you so much for sharing. Um, please feel free to keep reading in your own time. Um, but for now, uh, I'd like to uh, move on to our first talk of today. So um, we're delighted to have Alex Chen here with us. Um, Alex is a software developer at the Wellcome Trust, I believe. I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself, Alex. Wonderful. Let me just share my screen. Ah, am I able to share my screen so I can show slides? It says host has disabled participant screen sharing. One second. <laughs> <laughs> um, Malvika, I don't have the rights. Alex, can you try again? I certainly can. Aha, yes, I can now. Oh, hold on. Sorry, give me two seconds. I uh, just need to tell my computer that yes, it's allowed. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Right, sorry, I have to quit and come back in. I'll be back in two seconds. No problem. Meanwhile, I can engage. Uh, Alex had given this talk in the last round and we've used that talk in several workshops because uh, I don't think you and I thought it, we could do better job than that. So now Alex back and can. Yeah, sorry, it's a brand new machine and I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, this is the first time using Zoom on it. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Yep. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's always lovely to be back at, to be back. It's lovely to be back at these calls. This is a talk I gave for the first cohort. I've adapted it, updated it slightly, bringing it back for round two. I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of inclusion design and tell you some stories that show what happens when we don't think about it. And I also want to talk a bit about unconscious bias. We've obviously talked a little bit just now about perhaps it's not always the most helpful thing. I want to talk about a framing that I find works really well for me and perhaps doesn't get people's hackles up in the same way. Now, although, as Emmy said, I'm a software developer, I think these ideas are broadly applicable and they certainly apply to science as much as they do to technology. Uh, and all the slides as notes I should point out as well, they're all on the link there. There's a transcript from when I did this talk the first time. So you'll be able to go and download the materials and find all the references afterwards. So let's start by, let me start by defining what I mean by inclusion. It's a term we hear a lot. It comes up usually in that key phrase, diversity and inclusion, uh, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. And it's worth explaining what I think it means because there are lots of very overlapping, slightly different ideas. So imagine you were holding some sort of party. Obviously it's 2020, so you're holding this party over Zoom. And you're encouraging lots of different people to come. You're sending out lots of invitations. If you send invitations far and wide, that's diversity. You're encouraging lots of different people to come, but you're not necessarily giving them any reason they'd want to come. If you make sure that everyone has a good time at the party, well, that's inclusion. That might mean that you're making sure that everyone gets a chance to speak, uh, stopping people interrupting each other, stopping them talking over each other, maybe even having a one-on-one -on -one call with somebody who finds the group calls really overwhelming. It's making the effort to make everyone feel included and safe. Diversity is about inviting people in. Inclusion is about making sure they feel welcome. Now in inclusive communities, people feel more comfortable to share their, they feel more comfortable, they feel more safe to share their experiences, to talk about their ideas, to challenge the status quo. And all of this has benefits for science. Now for science, we want to be having as many ideas as possible, as many ideas feeding into the pot and allowing a wide range of people to contribute helps us to get better science. But of course, this doesn't always happen in practice. 
in many groups, people feel excluded, unsafe, forgotten, and they don't feel able to contribute their ideas. So assuming it's not malice, why does this happen? To understand this, we need to talk about unconscious bias. Now, I don't love the term for similar reasons to some of what we discussed just, just, just before I started. You know, it feels quite negative. It feels quite critical and judgmental. You have biases and that makes you a bad person. And that's a shame because I think there's a useful idea here. So I prefer to think of it a different way. Humans are very good at pattern matching. We look at the world, we spot patterns, and we create rules about how we think the world works. Everything is A or B. If P, then Q. All X's are Y's, and so on. Uh, and this, this is a useful behavior. These rules are actually uh, enable us to participate in a functioning society. For example, we've all internalized the rule today that if one person is talking, we wait for them to finish before we start talking ourselves. That's a useful rule. But the rules we come up with aren't always correct. And the more of the world we see, the more we have to update our rules based on new ideas and information. This is a natural part of being human. The problem occurs when we come up with these rules unconsciously. I mean, we're so good at it, we often don't realize how many rules we've internalized. We don't notice we've adopted a rule until we see something that breaks it. We see something that breaks our model of how the world works. And that for me is what unconscious bias is. We imagine the world follows a particular rule, but that rule excludes or overlooks some groups of people. And when we act upon that rule, when we behave in a way that only, when we follow that rule, we can do something that makes people feel unwelcome. So having unconscious biases isn't a moral judgment on us, it's just our pattern matching behavior gone awry. The moral judgments start when it's pointed out and perhaps we start to get a bit resistive to it. But that's really what unconscious bias is for me. It's, a, it's pattern matching gone a bit over, it's overzealous pattern matching, not some terrible evil sin. So let's look at a few examples of perhaps unconscious bias gone a bit wrong. So first of all, let's start with smartphones. I imagine most of you have a smartphone, maybe you use it to record video, maybe you upload that video to a sharing site like YouTube. When YouTube released their first upload app for the iPhone, they discovered that about five or 10% of their users were uploading videos upside down. Now, why was this? Was it a mistake? Was it a fashion trend or a statement piece? Was it something all the cool kids were doing, but you had to know, you had to be in the know? No, it was a misunderstanding about how people hold their phones. If you look at this picture, you'll notice the person is holding the phone in their left hand. So their, don't, so their right hand is free to tap the on-screen controls. That tells us this person is probably a right-handed user like the majority of the population. But now imagine a left-handed person was recording video. They would probably hold the phone in their right hand with their left hand free to tap the controls and they'd hold the phone the other way up. YouTube's mostly right-handed development team hadn't thought of this use case. They'd internalized a bad rule. If somebody is recording video, they always hold their phone in one orientation. It's a bit embarrassing, and it wasn't until they had left-handed users they realized their mistake. Let's look at another example. I know the Open Life Science course includes some sessions on Git and GitHub, both very widely used pieces of software. I use them every day in my job. And one of the great features of Git is that it keeps an immutable record of your changes. It is impossible to change history without it being disruptive or obvious. And that immutable history includes your code, your commit message, the timestamp, and your name. The, person, the committer's name, the author's name, is permanently baked into the code history. And this can cause problems for people who change their names because their old name will remain in the Git history. I have trans friends who've changed their name and had to choose between abandoning a large body of work or accepting that the Git history will forever out them as trans. Now, I don't think this was malice on the part of the original Git developers. They just internalized a bad rule. They'd internalized the rule that nobody ever changes their name. It didn't occur to them that this design choice might exclude some users until way later. And now, of course, we're all stuck with it. Now let's look at an example from my workplace. Uh, so I work at Welcome Collection, which is a museum and library about the history of human health and medicine. For those who are unfamiliar with it, a museum is a building containing objects and artifacts that you can go to to look at, to learn about history, 
that we visited in the before times. Outside our physical collections, we have a large collection of digital images. Uh, we'd love to use machine learning and computer vision to tag the images, to describe them, so that users can search for them without having to be cataloged by a person. So maybe an algorithm, for example, could tell us that these four images are a man, a mountain, a market, and a mole. But we have to be careful because machine learning is very good at replicating biases in the training set. And there are plenty of stories about algorithms replicating the unconscious biases of the humans who trained them. A few years back, Google got in hot water for tagging images of black users as gorillas. Microsoft have had similar issues with motion tracking in their games consoles. And there's a story that does with Randall Twitter every six months of a black person goes to a hotel that uses fancy motion detection taps and the tap doesn't see their hand. A more racially aware team might have caught these issues before they shipped to customers and before they were shipped to hundreds of, or thousands of people. Now, finally, let's move out of the digital realm and look at a physical example, modern cars. Modern cars are extremely safe. They're subject to rigorous crash testing. They're packed with safety features. And as you can see here, many cars sacrifice themselves so that we may be safe. But repeat studies show that women are more likely to die in car accidents. And that's because until fairly recently, crash tests only featured male body dummies. They were based on a 50th percentile American man, and that was the basis around which safety features were designed. Now women, especially smaller women, are quite different from this body shape and size, and they experience the forces in a collision in a more severe way. The car industry does now use a wider variety of crash test dummies, but it's gonna be years or even decades before this inequality in safety features is completely worked out of the market. So what's the message here? Uh, what I hope these short stories show is that inclusion has to be part of our design process. It's not something we can add later. It's not something we can sprinkle on at the end. It has to be something we think about throughout our work, throughout whatever it is we're designing. It's much harder, and frankly, a bit embarrassing to fix something after the fact rather than getting it right from the early stages. We need to think about inclusion throughout. Inclusion has to be part of our design process. And so if we accept that inclusion is important and it's something we want to do, how do we get better at it? Now, we could all just try really, really hard not to be biased and not to be prejudiced and trying really hard to do something doesn't really work. Okay, that's not going to, that alone isn't going to cut it. We have to actually sort of come up with process or changes, changes to our process. So let's go back to the idea of rules. We exclude people because we internalize rules that don't accommodate people, that don't include them. And these rules we don't realize we're making. So how do we spot them? How do we know a rule is bad if we don't even realize it's there? And the way we do this, well, the way we do this in science, right? If we've got a rule and we want to see if the rule is wrong, we go out and we collect data. And sometimes the data tells us about a rule, something is wrong that we didn't even realize we were investigating. In the same way, we need to collect more data about humans, about people, about the rules we're gathering. And so the way I like to do this is to go out and widen our worldview, go out and listen to people who have different experiences to us. Because if we're not gonna know a rule is bad until we see a counterexample, we've got to go out and get more data that might give us counterexamples. Uh, personally, I find Twitter and books really useful for this. I try to follow and read people who are different to me so I learn about their lives and challenges and that affects my view of the world. I actually track in my, as I'm tracking a little spreadsheet of what books I'm reading, I track how many books am I reading from authors who are, different, who are from a different racial background or a different gender or had a different upbringing to me. Those certainly aren't the only ways to do it. Um, find, you know, find any medium that lets you hear from people who don't look like you, uh, but it's the one that works for me. So I hope I've convinced you that inclusion has to be part of the design process. It has to be something we think about throughout. It can't just be something you tack on at the end. To be more inclusive, Try taking my framing of unconscious bias as a series of internalized rules. Try to think about those rules, those patterns that you don't even realize you're spotting, those, those rules you don't even realize you're using, and try to find ways to spot the unhelpful patterns that you've internalized. And on that note, I will finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Alex, for the, yeah, just, 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 the real lifeness of those examples and like how it's all embedded around us and how folks if you have any questions or thoughts 
to that talk, um, please share them in the Google Doc. We are at the end of page seven or here on the Zoom chat as well. Um, yeah, uh, or if you have any sort of inspiration, <laughs> things that you started suddenly started noticing around you that that follows that that don't again um, doesn't seem to have inclusion baked into the design process or ways that you found useful for yourself to keep track of your to try and notice those unnoticed rules within your your um, uh, day to day. Please let us know as well. It's looking at the typing coming in. <clears throat> Gonna take uh, Morvika's question, Alex. Um, any important tips of designing work to avoid misinformation? Oh, that's a really good question and, and such a pertinent one in 2020. Um, I think for me, it is, I think an important thing to remember is that not everyone comes from the same background as us and not everyone has the same interest in the topic as us. And so thinking about our communications and our, the accessibility of what we the information we're sharing is really important. Um, because not everyone has a scientific background, for example, right? Obviously we're talking in the news in the last 24 hours has been the new vaccine for COVID-19 and there are various scientific papers studied and I'm sure if you're an immunologist or an epidemiologist or you're a biologist you can go and read those and you'll be able to understand for yourself what these vaccines mean why they're safe um, but if that's the level of communications we're doing that's not necessarily appropriate for everyone uh, and meanwhile right that information is not very accessible meanwhile somebody lying about it and saying that um I know that if you have this vaccine, your ears will turn blue. That's a simple message that's going to spread halfway around the world. Thinking about and so acknowledging right, our communications have to be pitched to people at different level. And we need to be able to meet them to a certain degree where they are, because information that's inaccessible is not going to be able to spread. It's just going to get lost. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, Ariel says she agrees so hard with you. <laughs> Um, yeah, meeting meeting people where they are really, really, really yeah. resonates with me. Too. Oh yeah, and a really a really good suggestion there as well from in Ariel as well from in the chat about uh, translated communications into languages other than English. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there is a second question. Um, yeah. Just going to read this. Thank you. Uh, have you found any useful ways to make people aware that they need to act to combat their biases? Um, They've come up against people who acknowledge that they have unconscious or implicit biases, but then decide that because it's implicit, it isn't their fault. So they don't need to really do anything about it other than acknowledge that it exists. Yeah, so this is that's a that's a, another really good question. And one that I think is subject to a lot of um, there are a lot of like competing ideas about this. One of the more common suggestions, answers to this question, one that I used to give is to sort of point to the, uh, actually, actually, yeah, let me step back. Um, so I guess the way to do this often is to find a way to relate it back to the mission. What are you here to do? Um, you know, you presumably, this person you're working with, you presumably have some shared goal in mind. So maybe for example, your goal is to, um, is to hire an applicant for a, is to hire somebody for a job, and you obviously you obviously care about making that job application process as inclusive as possible. And then they'd be like, eh, whatever, it's implicit bias, it's not my fault. And so, but the mission is really you want to get the best possible person you can get, and the the way to do that is to get the widest possible variety of candidates. So you want to find a way that people will feel welcome and included in that process and want to apply for your job. Uh, if you have people who are sort of self-selecting out for tribute for you know reasons that are unrelated to their ability to do the job, that's not helping you get the best person. Um, so you sort of, yeah, I, I find often you have to relate it back to what's the mission? How does being more inclusive help the mission? And it always does, right? It, you know, there are lots of ways that it um it helps the mission, but yeah, that's the sort of way I think often will justify it because 
people are not that excited about inclusion for inclusion's sake. Some people don't like that and it's certainly not a perfect answer because what we're now doing is we're tying inclusion to a particular value or a business outcome or whatever. You know, for example, um, accessible transport. Accessible transport is really important, making sure that step people in wheelchairs can use railway is really important. And that shouldn't be tied to how many people are using the public transport network. And you know, if the numbers drop below a certain number, we shouldn't do it. Inclusion for inclusion's sake is really important, but if that's not getting through to somebody, um, often relating it back to the mission can be a way to open that door a bit wider. Thank you. Yeah, just again, yeah, it, it just rings so strongly to me, you know, the, the message that you have to like consider that this this person is also someone who yeah have you have to meet them where they are as well so, so that they they understand um how this type of thinking is it's how this thinking this way is actually beneficial to the work that they are doing and the goal that they want to achieve um i will leave the floor open for another 10 seconds for folks who have uh further questions for ask. Please feel free to um, put them in the Zoom chat or on the Google Doc at the top of page eight at the moment. All right, if not, um, thank you so much, Alex, for, for the wonderful talk. And uh, the slides are in the Google Doc as well, folks, if you want to refer back to it. Um, I myself is a bit, I'm a bit slow usually <laughs> in thinking of things. So I, I find it useful to, to go back to the slides and thank you for making that possible. This is the organizers of, of, the, of the cohort meeting me where I am. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's just, just following on from that talk and thinking about sort of design processes that, that involves inclusion at its very core. Um, um, five minutes of silent reflection uh, at the bottom half of uh, page eight of the Google Doc. What was insightful about think design thinking for inclusion? Um, what sort of lessons can you apply directly to your project? And or what are you doing now to combat bias? What can you do maybe together or individually in the future? Um, just a couple of minutes of um, sharing your thoughts or reflections if you if you may if you like to towards the bottom half of page eight on the google doc See a lovely resource, res, resource that has gone up on the top point um, about um, design blind spots. So folks can, can check out the um, episode. Curious about this, is, is this a, a podcast as well? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the comment underneath as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, we should avoid the term blind spot if possible. Um, use the term awareness gap or dead spot. Thank you so much for the reminder.
folks commenting that it's great to have concrete examples. Definitely 100% agree. Um, they really help us see, um, spot more of these unnoticed rules that we have around, around our world. Someone mentioned talking circles. Would you like to share what that is? Hi, hi, hi. Hi, Camilla. Hi, I just I read on a book, uh, and I think it's like a it's, it's a North American indigenous uh, kind of tradition. Is where like everyone gets has to have their say in like whatever decision you're doing and you ask people to say whatever they want to say and that kind of uh, makes people like feel included because maybe unless you ask them they, don't, they wouldn't speak and like and, and the decision has to be kind of a anonymous, uh, 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 unanimous um, so I feel like that that's a good way of making feel, people feel included because you're always asking everyone is hurt. Yeah. That's great thank you so much for sharing Camila. Yeah um, it's a good way to engage folks, especially I, I find it personally to when when folks are new maybe to a, to a certain community um, may not necessarily feel like they have the space or to 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 voice their opinion or stories. Um, this is could be a useful way to engage them. Someone's been learning about different ways to accommodate visual impairments in the context of the internet. Definitely, yes. Um, folks, if you have any resources on that end to share as well, that would be really, really great to learn about. That's such, such an important point. So much of the world around us is built for those who are, um, so much of the world around us is visual. And uh, it's always good to keep in mind those who are perhaps slightly less well-sighted. All right, sorry, I'm just slowly reading, <laughs> but all of you have such um, interesting thoughts and um, in reflections that are useful, I'm sure, for a lot of us. Uh, again, please uh, do keep thinking about this, and um, but for now, um, pass over to Malvika. Thank you, Amy. Um, so now is the chance for next two speakers who've been in the call. Um, the next speaker is Tanya Allard, and I really like her first line in LinkedIn, which says, I'm a data scientist, machine learning specialist, a technical geek, a mentor, and open source developer and a diversity and STEM advocate. Uh, she's really, really everything and more. She has a lot of experience in community building and uh, I'm just very excited that she has a chance to share some of her knowledge with you today. So to you, Tanya. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Tanya Lard, and I'm going to try to share my screen. Hopefully that works. Uh, yeah. Oh, I think you should all be able to see that now. Um, well, I'm going to be talking to you about the mountain of engagement and community interactions. Like Malvika said, I am, well, I've been spending a lot of time building communities, interacting with different communities, um, and that's a passion of mine. And just for those of you that don't know me, uh, Malvika already did a bit of inter uh, introduction about some of the things that I do. Um, I am currently working at Microsoft as a developer advocate, and part of my job is actually working with communities mostly. I work with the open source and data science and research communities um, to try to make their work better. And this is very, very broad. There are many ways in which this can happen from doing technical stuff to um, help supporting these communities and work towards sustainability of communities and projects. Uh, my favorite color is purple, and I saw on the Google Doc that someone said that purple is not visible in the 
visible spectrum, so it's not really a color like pink. Um, and I love mechanical keyboards. And I'm just going to give a uh, disclose because uh, during this whole lockdown, my dog seems to always know when I'm giving a talk. Um, and I would say like 80% of the time, she just shows up and starts uh, jumps and legs my and my my face. So you're warned that that might might happen. And um, I'm going to talk about first the mountain of engagement, which is uh, how you've identified pathways and patterns of engagement in your work and your project. And this is very, very important, especially when we're working in the open ecosystem. So sustainability comes a lot from your community and their original projects for the community, nurtured by the community. When we think about, let's say, the corporate world or our scientific labs or um, these environments that are a bit more regulated, we are able to see well-defined managerial levels where we know that we have folks that are, um, let's say, project managers that probably don't manage people, but projects themselves will have the managers or your supervisors or, or the lab PIs. So these levels are, are very well defined and they normally tend to have a hier hierarchical structure that also defines uh, the interactions uh, in the downstream of that mountain. When we move into open spaces or into open projects, we also have a, diff a slightly different mountain where the, the different scaffolding or the different levels in the hierarchy are also filled by our community members. And this can be you, for example, that started a project, but also all of the other folks that you're gonna be interacting with and onboarding as your project evolves um, or becomes a bit more mature. And when we think about collaboration, especially, um, you are now well advanced into this open life science program. Probably you'll have discussed what what collaboration is and what how you can um, how you can include other folks so they can start collaborating and engaging with your projects. Um, but just as a reminder, sometimes we do, we only manage to see a certain level as um, forward facing or public facing of this collaboration. But for you to have healthy and safe and long-term collaboration and engagement with your community member, there are a lot, a lot of uh, processes and activities that are involved. Um, like Alex mentioned before, one of the core um, bases for a healthy collaboration or community is having accessibility as a first and foremost thought and inclusion, how you're gonna bring all of these diverse voices and ensure that they are all heard uh, and they are all empowered in your project. And this is very, very important because as you start bringing folks from all over the world from with diverse backgrounds from different walks of life, you have to ensure that all of your members and all of your community folks have the equal opportunity to exchange their values and the most important part is that they also are empowered themselves and can empower each other to take uh, to take action, to make suggestions, to enhance your community, your community experience, and in general, have a safe culture. And we normally achieve this through discovering pathways, which is how someone finds your project, engage with your project, and then probably onboards into it. So first we want to understand how people are hearing on, or learning about our project, how people are coming to our community, our organization, our lab, and also what culture we are facing, um, what, what culture we are showcasing or they're facing from their outward perspective. Um, also, we need to understand how our contributors or our community members transition from a certain level in a community interaction to another level. Um, so a very common, uh, when we talk about 
uh, engagement and onboarding in open source projects. We normally talk about the first stage being awareness, then we have engagement, then we have onboarding, consolidation, and probably offboarding. How are the mechanisms or the processes in which someone can go from one step to the other and develop paths in which the people can actually uh, be engaged throughout these different steps of engagement and even up to leadership, of course. So there are many, many ways in which we can uh, promote leadership within our, uh, within our projects or that we can actually encourage those folks that want to move uh, upwards to leadership positions or more engaged positions within our project. Um, there are going to be some folks, for example, that become uh, that will become your own advocates or the advocates of your projects. There are some other folks that will probably start with small uh, tasks like fixing a bug or uh, fixing a typo, for example. And by means of the culture and the interactions with the folks that are already well engaged with the project, they'll they'll remain or they'll stay within your community and your project. And it is this interactions um, inside and within our project that leads to this uh, process of moving upwards the mountain of engagement. So for you to identify how this interaction, uh, how these different steps and these different levels in your mountain of interaction uh, operate within themselves, there are five steps that you can take. Um, the first is identifying or being aware of um, what are the different kind of interactions that people or your community has with your work. And then separate your level of engagements in, within that hierarchical structure. You're going to have, uh, it is like a pyramid structure because um, the narrower, well, the higher you go into your mountain, also your um, your interactions or your engagement activities should be much more narrowed or, or scoped. Once you have uh, identified how folks are interacting with your project or with your, uh, yeah, with, with your project, you can start grouping your interactions within the bands uh, that you've identified in the levels of engagement and identify what activities or what processes actually help or which activities don't work to keep folks engaged and allow them to move upwards in leadership positions. And finally, you have to prioritize you also your work to create more opportunities. Um, and this is especially because the crucial, I've mentioned it before and I mention it every time when I talk about leadership and um, inclusiveness in open source communities. Um, the, your, your core goal as a the maintainer or a, leader or a leader of an open source or an open project is to create more opportunities and empower those folks within your community and your project. Because although we also want, uh, probably you want to be forever in your project, there might be a, way, a, a time in which you or other folks in leadership position will have to step down. And you need to ensure sustainability of your project. And this can only be achieved by empowering your community and your community members. So let's break this down into a more concrete example. So when we think about our project, there are many different ways in which people start interacting. Sometimes we use social media to uh, talk about our project, what we're doing, we write, uh, we write blogs, for example, we host uh, local events. I think something that the Turing uh, way does really, really well is having all different kinds of events, um, whether it's collaboration cafes or book dashes, um, that, so that folks can come from different angles and so that this adapts more to whatever time and level of participation folks are interested in. And then this band of engagement relates directly to this path that I was mentioning before um, on how the first, how someone establishes first the first contact with your project, and then how they get engaged with it, and then how they are they end up towards participating, collaborating, and eventually leading. 
And then the third step is putting these two together. How identify first how someone is coming. So probably they found about your project or about your event through um, through a treat or through uh, a newsletter or word of mouth. And then for someone probably that was engaged at that very uh, at that very low level, maybe they want they like the community, they like the culture, they like the project, so they start getting more engaged and they eventually become a resource maintainer. Um, and then they want probably to become your advocates and organize events for you or lead participation or mentor others. But for these, sometimes we have uh, spells in which we get a lot of folks engaging and sticking around for a while. And then sometimes we have a lot of folks that jump into our project and eventually just leave or, or disappear. And it's very important that we understand why this is happening. Uh, what are the main barriers that these folks are facing? Um, and what are the things that are actually allowing them to move towards leadership and how we are actively in, um, empowering them within our community. And very good ways, uh, very good ways to identify uh, what is working and what is not working is, as I said, first identifying what are the things that are making this participation or engagement difficult, what are the blockers, or how we can better support our folks in our communities to overcome these blockers. Um, also, how we can make this whole transition or this whole, um, this whole engagement more accessible and easier for folks. And I think also something that I also like mentioning every time, and I talk a lot about offboarding and replacement of leadership, is allowing folks uh, or making it known that folks can step down or pause their interactions at any point because we all have lives we all have especially in this 2020 that has been so chaotic and nothing has been like normal um, we also have to normalize um, people taking time off to recharge and not burn out so that is also something that has to be very very visible in our communities allowing folks to step in, step down um, as they need it. So I want you to reflect and probably we can go over this later in our, um, I think we have a couple of minutes probably um, to think, to share about our thoughts. Um, and it is especially, what do you convey in your specific communities or your specific project about how you value, uh, delegate, and evaluate people in your culture? And also, if you're, you have already started to see patterns in which folks start engaging with your project from an early, early stage and how they're moving towards or upwards or downwards in your mountain of engagement, what are um, the things that are working for you and what are uh, your own leadership goals when it comes to getting people into your project and off of your project? Now, for, for you to be able to do this, uh, for you to be able to reflect and have a solid plan of engagement and leadership, um, you have to keep data. You have to track what you're doing. You have to make sure that you know who's, in, who's being um, involved in your project, who's engaging, who's leaving. Um, and all of this is a lot of data. So. Think about GDPR whenever you are tracking anything within your project, especially when it comes to people. Um, make sure that you're not disclosing any personal data. Uh, make sure that also folks are aware of what kind of data you're taking, uh, you're, you're collecting. May, uh, also make all of this um, data collection voluntary. So if anyone doesn't 
doesn't want to disclose certain kind of data or information, allow them to do that, uh, but also be very, very clear about what sort of data you're collecting, who's going to access it, how long it's going to be uh, stored for, and how you're going to get rid of this data. Uh, I know this is like the, the boring um, disclose or little print letters, uh, but it's very, very important. And now as, you're, uh, as you start identifying these processes and these pathways and you start engaging with folks, you're going to start building a much broader picture um, and much, uh, many more stories about how people discover your project and how you are building your own culture. By doing this, you are also able to discover successes and challenges and highlight that to develop your community practices. And this necessarily brings us to community interactions, which is you are uh, you already have um, all of this engagement, you have all of these processes for folks uh, to move into your different leadership positions or mountain of engagement. So we have to start thinking again how our like the different areas in our communities interact with each other. And within the open leadership framework with Musiala, uh, when we the, uh, there is this framework where we actually design for understanding, sharing, and participation and inclusion. And this is basically what, uh, what ties together the differing uh, kind of community interactions that we can bring into our project. And I'm going to just give, go through some examples for, for this. Um, so the first example and something that we think a lot when we talk about open source is idea of gifting. That I'm giving you a present with no strings attached. Um, so you see the value of it so that you can start using it and building it, uh, building on it or reuse it for your own purpose. And there are many, many reasons or many advantages of having these open models or having these gift approach. First is you're incentivizing adoption. Uh, you're also reducing the barriers of adoption for folks. Um, you can because also you have um, an open culture and an open development, you can strive to have improved products and services. Then the next uh, community interaction is creating together. And this again ties very, very closely with the open source culture, which is sharing the tasks and cost of achieving a pre-established goal. Um, sometimes um, in open source budgets are very, very tight. A lot of this is run in volunteer time. So there are three, uh, three pillars of again, contributions that we can bring. One is money, the other one is time, and the other one is expertise. And whatever it is that you can provide to an open source or a project or open community, this always leads again to better product because you, that means that you're bringing folks that have different experiences, different expertise. And if you are able to spur some of your time uh, as well, you're lowering um, some operational costs because that means that you're not having to hire someone. Again, this is one side of the coin when we have another side of the coin of open source that is again um, the disadvantage of it being all built uh, and relying on, on voluntary time. Um, another way of interacting with your community is learning through use. Um, and it relies, it, sorry, it is based on collecting and analyzing activity to improve products and services. And I think Spotify is a very good product. That do, it's a product that does this very, very, very good. Um, and I've, I don't know if you've seen in social media now, everyone or a lot of folks are sharing their year in review. 
Um, this is something that is not done through machine learning or AI, but it's actually collecting data, identifying how the community and how folks are interacting with this platform or this product to drive new insights, new community engagement. Um, and folks are, are loving sharing all like these stories, like this idea of what they're listening to, they're finding uh, other common grounds with other folks that listen, for example, to the same music, to the same podcast. And the main advantages of this is that one, you as whoever is developing this product, you understand your users, um, you understand how they're using your product, what uh, works, what doesn't work. You can also improve products um, or work on strategies to better engage, um, to better engage with your community and your users. And also we see a lot of fail fast uh, where it, getting find something that is not working very easily and then um, remove that feature, for example. Um, and something that I think uh, all of the net the Bastilla network does very well is networking around common interests. So that it is coordinating to ensure that individual activities achieve more towards a shared mission. Uh, for example, when we think, we think about uh, Mozilla, we think, about an organization whose main purpose is preserving the internet, making it more accessible, more safe, um, and more inclusive. And we have all of these programs. Now we have, for example, Open Life Science that um, spun out from the Open Leadership Program from Mozilla, but it all drives towards the same mission of making tech much more, or tech or open communities more inclusive and more accessible and safer. Um, so although some of these initiatives uh, might seem that they don't fall under the direct same umbrella, uh, they do share uh, a mission and they all work to work together. So uh, they will work together toward a common interest. So the question for this section is, um, to think about that one open advantage of your project and how you are actually, um, what community interactions would help you to achieve your goals. Depending on what kind of project you're working on, um, probably you're gonna lean more towards the networking side, like working with partnering projects or probably understanding how your users or your community are benefiting from your project. So we have to also be very, very aware of which are the most meaningful community interactions that we can have. And just to close up, there, uh, there is some further, further reading. I think these are already in the Google Doc, uh, but also the slides are there. So I really, really encourage you to Read a, bit, uh, read a bit more about mountain of engagements and start doing a, an exercise within your project and how you see this user or, or this contributor and collaborator path uh, applying to your own project. I think that is it. So I've stopped sharing. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, that was, that's one of the most important lessons from this entire cohort. So if you're taking something about community engagement, please come back to this talk. Um, and we also have an assignment on that. So before we close off Tanya's talk, is there any question we have? Uh, you can add it in the chat. So we have one from Helia. Uh, wait, I have two questions. Let's start with Kate's. Kate, would you like to verbalize it? Okay, I'm gonna read. Um, wait, Hi. Okay. So, yeah, I was just interested about the um, voluntary aspect of open source working. Um, I, oh, is it my connection? You're okay. I don't know if there's a delay, but I'm happy for you to read it, Malvika. Okay, so uh, yeah, so Kate's question is about people's volunteer time and how could it be collaborative if it was more market-based, if there is 
uh, any insight on that? Yeah, think- it just just got me thinking around like the benefits and negatives of that. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So I think um, we also have. Uh, I want to make the distinction between community-led open source and corporate-led open source. So we have like this two variants of the same movement. Um, so normally when we think about, cor- let's say, corporate-led open source, if you're in the machine learning sphere, you'll probably think about TensorFlow uh, projects like that that are open source, but they are all backed by Google. And uh, it started with Google. They rely heavily on the Google communities. So that on one side ensures a certain level of sustainability. But again, it also aligns a lot uh, with the, the mission and the roadmap of whoever that corporation is pushing the development of the open source. Um, so probably this, the, the ensure sustainability um, and knowing that you have like a fallback um, helps with, with the longevity of the project. Uh, when we think about community uh, open source projects, it is all entirely on the community. So uh, if you don't have, for example, onboarding and offboarding mechanisms, and you only have, let's say, one leader that does everything, that is the core maintainer that onboards everything, manages, I don't know, fiscal sponsorship, if that person were to leave because life or die because people die or whatever, um, the sustainability of that project is heavily compromised. Um, So... We have, I think, open source is collaborative um, because of the intrinsic freedoms that it brings to the users and the community. Um, But the main difference, it's not probably not going to be in the collaboration side, but in the sustainability side, uh, when you think about these two strands. Kirsty, you have something to add? No, sorry, mine is on the net. On there's another question that's in the chat. So sorry, it was the. Uh, okay, so I you. have to unfortunately move on. Thank you so much, Tanya and Hilia. Wait for uh, next talk because there will be a few few insights. So thank you so much again, Tanya, for this very detailed talk. Thanks for having really me here. Detailed. So yeah, our next speaker is Ben. Uh, Ben is a physicist. He's also a Software Sustainability Institute Fellows from where I know him. Uh, Tanya is also a SSI Fellow, by the way. Ben also works on another project which he had recently used Persona and Pathways for, and that's why I thought that this would be a great chance for him to share insights on that. So to you, Ben. Thanks, Mavika. Can you you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you well. Okay, great. And I guess you can see my screen fine. Um, perfect. So yeah, thank you very much. It's a it's a real pleasure to be here. Actually, it's been a really educational morning for myself as well. I've really enjoyed the talk so far, uh, and I hope I can sort of uh, well meet the level that they've sort of set. So um, br- briefly, uh, I, I mean, now we could briefly just said this, but uh, just so you understand where I'm coming from. I mean, uh, I know this is an open life science of course, but I'm actually a particle physicist, so I work at CERN. Uh, but I'm employed by the University of Bristol. I work on two different experiments to look for dark matter. Um, but I actually um, work on quite a few different projects. So um, a few open source code projects that we use in our physics. And so that's what's got me this fellowship with the SSI. Uh, and also I play a leading role in two, two other things, well, several things, but two of which I'll sort of use as examples briefly. So one is uh, a thing called the port, which is an annual humanitarian hackathon that we run at CERN to sort of bring a ver- big variety of people together, not just physicists, but really many, many different um, skills and backgrounds to tackle humanitarian problems. Um, and then also this uh, remotely green project, which we can briefly mention, uh, which has been going since 2019, basically trying to make events move online so that we can make them more accessible to everyone around the world and actually reduce the environmental impacts of these events. But for me, I think the, the common theme uh, for everything I, I, you know, I like to work on, it's, you know, they're big products, but they're very always, always very open. There's very, very flat you know, leadership structures. There's very distributed, um, uh, um, sort of yeah, community-driven uh, approaches, um, and so I, I, I think this what I'm going to talk to you about here has been really useful for me when I, as I've learned these concepts, um, it's of how I help shape and, and work on these these projects. 
So what I'm going to go through um, are really these three points. So uh, understanding personas, um, which really is help, ham trying to help you understand who make up your community, who, who is there. Uh, then think through their pathways. So it relates quite a lot to what Tyna was just saying about you know, the, their journey as they get involved with your project. Um, and then finally, a couple of slides at the end on how we can make that, the, these pathways smoother in general. I should say a thank you to, to Kirsty because I've borrowed a lot of, well, she, she presented this last year and, and I've been heavily inspired by what she presented last time. Um, and so the big point here is understanding, how, you know, in the end, how you can increase participation in, in your projects. Um, so this is sort of a, a key message that sits behind a lot of what you'll probably hear on this course um, and about, you know, how open leaders, we need to design and build these projects that really empower others to collaborate within these communities. Um, these inclusive communities. And I think for the context of this talk, it's really the, the point about designing these projects, but also um, to then really bring others in to collaborate. Um, and so in that sense, the I really like this sort of image. So this is a, a bridge somewhere in, in Vietnam. Uh, but I think it's a I, the, the point here is you have to sort of change how you think about this. It's probably very natural to think, um, you know, I want to bring people in because I need to get more people to you know work on this. It's too much for me to do on my own and so on. And the point is you're probably thinking of the problem in the wrong way. Um, you, you need to think not about what they can do for me, but really what can we do for them? And that is the way, if you can understand that question, you'll, uh, you'll actually attract people in. And so for me, it's not just about thinking, you know, uh, I want to walk across this bridge, so I need someone to support it, but you are the, you are the big hands in this image. You're the one that's supporting uh, this community. So uh, point number one, so we're going to like talk first about personas. So the point with the persona is to understand who it is that you're trying to support. Uh, so this, uh, it's really a tool. And the point is to, to come up with a description of, of a person that you believe will be representative of, of people in your community. So that, make it imaginary, make sure it's not, you know, don't, it's often better to make it imaginary. So it's not too tied to someone you, you know uh, very well or, or yourself and so on. But also do think about how, what are the sort of real world um, observations you've had when you've interacted with people you would like to attract. Um, and so uh, the point here is you will use a persona to sort of frame uh, the sorts of people you would like to see here. Um, within a persona, you would typically put a few very specific details. So you know, give them a name. It makes it much more concrete if they have a name, but don't make it too much about, you know, don't use your own name, don't you know, avoid using a friend or something. Um, give them an age, give them some sort of convincing details, something like, you know, uh, where do they live? How, you know, how do they travel? You know, what, what are their hobbies? Um, think a bit about their skills. What's their level of knowledge? What would be their education and so on? Um, and so that you can really uh, understand you know, where they'll be coming from. Um, and so, uh, and then finally, and the last, probably the last two that are most important, think through what are their motivations and what are their fears? Where are they, you know, what, what are they going to be looking for to, to get out of this? And also think through what are their pains? So these may not be things they're con conscious of, but what are the things they maybe get frustrated with in their day to day? Uh, and what sort of things may they, may that will they want to get? You know, is it maybe they want to you know, see their name on, on GitHub or maybe they want to actually, they, they really just value being part of that, that big uh, sort of open project. Um, and one thing to point out, you know, if it's hard to come up with the, these sorts of attributes for a particular person, it's actually a good tool just to check that you've understood your community. So going through this list, building this sort of uh, persona up, you should be able to do it quite easily. And if you can't, then it's a suggestion that you maybe need to, you know, talk to others, reflect on, on how many more people, you know, you should uh, discuss this, the, your project with before you start putting it together. Um, a, a couple of times in this, I'm going to flash up these sort of canvases. I, I really like this way, this sort of way of thinking. So this is a, a canvas. You can you know, fill out the different fields uh, and sort of use this to build up what your personas will look like. Um, this is an example one that I used for the Remotely Green project. I know it's messy and I apologize because I have terrible handwriting, uh, which is why I'm pleased we're doing things online a lot more these days. Uh, but you, you know, the, the point here is, you know, you see in the middle that you've got, uh, we, you know, we've got an idea of who is this person, Daniel, he's a conference organizer of age 30. Um, uh, it's, for him, it's really important that he has a community of people uh, on his project. Um, and then we can sort of think through the sort of characteristics of them. Um, so uh, you can see some other examples here. Now, um, a really uh, crucial point is you don't just do this once. So this is a, you know, you often have to build many personas. There'll be many different people in the in your community. 
So, um, you know, on the one hand, you may need to think through you know, the student side of it. But on the other hand, you may want to think through, you know, maybe you've got professors that you want to involve or, or other, you know, um, uh, other types of, of person. So you will often have to come up with multiple different personas that really try and capture the full scope of who you want to include in, in there. And, and, you know, you can do it different ways. You can use the canvas, but you can also just, uh, you know, write a, you know, a couple of paragraphs, but that's easier. Okay, so we've got our personas. So the next thing you want to do is, is think through what will be their, their journey? What will be the pathway um, for these people? So how will they transition from, how can you encourage them to transition from just being a visitor to the project? Maybe, you know, seeing a, a piece of code somewhere or hearing a, a talk briefly to actually getting involved, contributing and potentially even leading it. Um, and so uh, the point here is it's not just about bringing um, new people in, but really moving those people forwards um, and sort of leveling them up as they evolve, uh, as, as they progress through it. Um, and so, uh, you know, to go back to that image of, of, the, uh, of the bridge, you know, it's the same bridge, but it's from a different angle. If we look at the, the problem from a different perspective, um, by mapping out the pathways, the, the goal here is to understand the potential issues, the potential challenges that might make their, their journey you know, less clear. Uh, so in other words, sort of removing the fog from, this, from, from you know, that journey, but also understanding that there may be different routes. You know, the, the routes that someone get involved with your, your project can be very different depending on how they first discover you, depending on what they want to get out of it. Um, so there's a really nice, there's another nice canvas uh, that can be very helpful to sort of work through. Um, uh, and so um, there are, you know, this is this is often another good thing to, to uh, flesh out. You basically see the different uh, key sort of stages, and you'll write out the different steps that happen at each stage. You'll often um, uh, want to think through, you know, is this a good moment? Maybe you'll have to include a bad moment. So this actually grows. You, know, you can see this canvas is called the customer journey. This has really grown out of sort of design thinking for for you know, building a real. Uh, a very tangible sort of product, but it makes total sense to apply this to a community as well. Um, here is a, a concrete example of one that's been filled in. So you see the different colors in the different uh, vertical bands. These are the sort of stages of their engagement as they're sort of leveling up, getting more involved. And then you put the specific actions at each one and you have this sort of line. And the, and the point here is to give a feeling, okay, well, they have a positive experience, so it goes up, but actually at some point, you know, in this example, the traffic is bad, so they have a, a bad impression. So that's very sort of focused on maybe a product you might have built, but in terms of an open project, these are the sorts of stages you'll typically um, want to consider. So, you know, to begin with, they'll discover your project. They'll maybe see a poster somewhere for an advertising event. Maybe they join that event, so they have this initial contact. Maybe they really love it, so they decide, you know, actually I would like to speak at a future event maybe. So they participate uh, and they sort of work down. So if they become a regular participant, you know, they come back many times, they get involved a bit more. Maybe they start promoting your event itself or actually starting new spin-off events and so on. Uh, so this is where they're moving into network participation. And at, at the very bottom here, they, they maybe even become sort of leaders within this, this community. Um, what what's, is important to stress, I mean, do this once, not just for one persona, but do this uh, multiple times. So if you have multiple personas, have multiple pathways, and even for the same persona, you can think of you know, what, what could be different pathways they can interact. So I adapted a, a you know an example here from a, a previous from I think I just one of the other talks uh, versions of this. So this is you know thinking from the, this port hackathon that I helped run. This is a typical sort of journey we've seen. Um, someone will will meet somebody else that took part in the previous year. They'll go home and maybe watch a recording of that that uh, event. Um, so that's the, their initial sort of contact, their initial sort of interaction. From there, they may apply to join the next year's hackathon, so they become a participant. And because they loved it so much, they, they come back the next year, but not just to participate, but actually to turn up in a, in a, in a sort of, um, as a more sort of a mentor, they're going to help one of the other teams now um, to move through it. And because that goes great, they actually get involved really planning the next year, you know, coming up with challenges, encouraging their friends to take part, really spreading the network itself. And eventually, you know, this, this uh, persona, Carla, she takes on a, a role, maybe as a co-treasurer or some other leadership role, um, and actually goes out and helps establish hackathons uh, elsewhere related to what we tried to achieve. Um, and so the last point on sort of this persona bit is, is sort of what I've said a bit So you already. So you need to um, think through these personas and the pathways. They're a guide for you to identify the potential barriers and then come up with solutions so you can bring uh, newcomers to your project in. 
Uh, but be aware that the, these solutions, they may change as, as these pathways evolve, as your community evolves, you may have to adapt both the pathways, but therefore also the solutions. And of course, the solutions that you come up with will, and, and the pathways will be totally dependent on the project. There's no one, one size fits all here. Um, and of course, the, the, the person that you're dealing with. So if you have, you know, for every project that you're involved with, for every persona you might um, imagine, and depending on you know, how often you've done this, you may have to revisit this, you may have to update it, you may have to rethink it. And so just lastly, um, I have a couple of slides. I don't, I don't know how long I have, but I have two slides on some suggestions, so I'll go quickly. Um, uh, so just at the top of those sort of steps, ideas for how you can make your project more discoverable and improve that first contact. Think through how you're going to publicize things. So maybe you want to create some posters and you know, put them around your department. Another really nice one is put a call to action out but within your events. So you know, get people, encourage people to tweet or, or you know, share what, what they're doing, what they see in your events. Make sure your meetings are friendly. I, I don't think I have to say that at all to this community because you know, these are always great, great sort of calls, but you know, do a round uh, table of introductions or put breakouts at the end where everyone can meet each other. Make sure the meetings are at good timing. In terms of code, make sure your repositories are easy to get started with. So obviously make sure you've got a contributing set of guidelines somewhere. Label, if you have issues, make sure they're labeled so that they're I mean, very clearly, this is a good issue to get started with. Um, and add a, there's a really nice tool that can help welcome people in, um, in a more automated way, it reduces your, your workload. And then sort of moving people down through this, this, these layers. Uh, in terms of the meeting structures, you know, at the end of the meetings, find a way to follow up with, with the people that took part, really encourage this Q&A and chances to work together with the SSI we've often done you know, uh, the collaborations workshop, there's always a, a chance for people to, you know, co-blog uh, or, or you know, hack together at the end uh, and give an opportunity for newcomers to give new talks. Um, in terms of communication, so this is really important because you're trying to build a community. It's not just one person working on their own. I've always found if you have something like Slack, Gitter, Matamos, whatever you choose, have some way that people can communicate instantly. Um, and the really nice idea, I think it was Kirsty's talk, last time but she suggested that these this idea of mentored issues so if you have issues that are um uh labeled as you know a good first issue uh also find people that could mentor that so if someone comes along and wants to work on it give them a clear indication of who can help them out and i think the last point i want to make is and it touches a little bit on what was asked in one of the questions um how can we motivate people to work on these projects um i think there's some really interesting studies that have shown that even as an employee, it's not, it's not money that motivates people the most. It's not having a great wage. The number one thing that motivates people is recognition. And so if you can find good ways to recognize the contributions people are making, to give them, um, to make sure it's clear, you know, you've done this and, and this is great and give them that opportunity, that, I think that really can build your project quite successfully. And again, there are some nice tools that can help make that uh, process simpler. So that's everything I wanted to go through. I'm sorry if it was a bit rushed. I, I sort of had this one little message at the end, which is that you can only make a watch from a bucket of gears uh, if you really understand each piece and put them, help them guide them into the right place. And I think that's the sort of metaphor for everything I've tried to talk through here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so I just want to say how many times I've heard this talk and every time I learned something new by different speakers. So this has been very insightful. And as Kirsty is saying, it's a, it, Kirsty has done a lot in the last round. You will hear different things and we might do it differently. So you can see recognition work in practice. <laughs> uh, all right. So I think we, we are out of time, uh, but Ben is on social media and uh, Ben, can people reach out to you by email or somewhere? Is that okay for them? For sure, yeah. We have okay, to. and if you have any question, please leave that on Google Doc. Uh, either I will ask Ben to respond to them or I will respond to them. Uh, I have to cut out the breakout room, unfortunately, today, but today was one of the most important cohort call and I didn't want speakers to not speak something that they didn't think was useful. So here are some things that we want to do uh, after this call is we have one persona and pathway assignment for you that we really encourage you to work on. We also have an assignment on mountain of engagement. When I was going through this training, mountain of engagement, hands down, one of the things that really helped me see what my community was like and how I wanted to develop them. Something that Ben also talked about, removing the fog and letting people see the journey is super important. And 
it, it should be documented in my opinions and this uh, assignment should help you do that we also uh, would encourage you to start doing a micro blog about your project and we'll share a little bit more about that in the email so with that i want to conclude this talk i'll stop recording but i'll hang out here and if ben is around then please stay for two minutes maybe people have some more questions to ask thank you so much for joining everybody